In 1980, I was a 25-year-old pastor, and my wife Nancy and I had a two-year-old daughter, and Nancy was carrying our second child. We opened our home to a teenage girl who was pregnant and had been kicked out of her home and was living with the father of her child. We found out later that she'd had an abortion in her past and likely would have gotten another, but we had the privilege of helping her place her child for adoption into a Christian home. We also had the great joy of seeing this teenage girl come to faith in Christ while living with us. And then about nine years ago, we were with her and her husband when she was reunited with her birth child when he was 33 years old. That girl we welcomed into our home as a teenager is both a sister and, and a daughter in the faith to us and one of our dearest friends. That's what pro-life efforts will do for you. They will connect you with amazing people in the providence of God. They will open doors to the gospel of Jesus and produce eternal results. When I was still a pastor, I was an advisor for a seminary student at my church. One day he said to me, you know, I think the pro-life issue is just distracting our church from doing the main thing. Kind of took me by surprise. I said, well, What's the main thing? And he says, well, the main thing is the Great Commission. It's winning people to Christ. Okay, later I'll tell you what I said to that seminary student. But let me read the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We'll come back to this, but first I want to tell you a true story. In the late 18th century, there lived an Englishman named William. William was an outspoken opponent of slavery. He even boycotted sugar from the West Indies, refusing to eat the product of slavery. He became what was known as a dissenter. British law prohibited anyone attending a meeting of dissenters, so William actually committed civil disobedience every time he preached. William felt God wanted him to go to India, where he entered as an illegal alien. He was shocked to discover that many of the Hindus took their infant children and exposed them to die. The British government in India looked the other way because it didn't want to interfere with the culture or religion. But William felt compelled to interfere because children were dying. He spoke out forcefully to prod both the British government and the Indian society. He called on them to change the laws. As a result, eventually, infanticide was abolished in India. Countless children were saved by the activism of William and his friends. The Hindus also practice a form of euthanasia in which they left the weak and sick and lepers out to die. William and the missionaries who joined him spoke out against this practice. Their efforts finally resulted in pro-life laws, but while exposure was still legal, the missionaries carried home people left to die and nursed them back to health. William provided medicine for such outcasts and also actively opposed slavery in India. Then one day, William witnessed something horrible. The practice called sati, a widow burned alive on the funeral pyre of her deceased husband. So William led a group of missionaries in protesting widow burning. He also set up public debates to expose what was really happening and to bring God's perspective to bear. Missionary magazines published William's arguments. As a result, in his lifetime, widow burning was abolished. William was a brilliant linguist and Bible translator. He was the British government's official translator into the Bengali language. He received the official decree forbidding widow burning on Sunday morning, December 6, 1829. 
William was scheduled to preach the gospel in church that morning, but he called on someone else to preach instead. He dedicated the whole day to translating the decree. Why? Because he knew that lives hung in the balance. Now, some people criticized William for his moral and political actions. They said, just preach the gospel. Stay away from politics and social and moral issues. So who was this radical social activist so concerned about morality and laws and saving human lives? His name was William Carey. Today, he is known as the father of modern missions. Whenever we think of the modern missions movement, no other name is as prominent as that of William Carey. He went to India to win people to Christ and disciple them and fulfill the Great Commission, and that's exactly what he did. In the process, he sought to obey other parts of God's word too by intervening to save lives and to change public opinion and evil laws. 46 years ago, I was pastoring a brand new church in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. When the church started, I pictured myself teaching the Bible. What I discovered is that I could teach the Bible and stay away from pro-life work, but I could not live the Bible and stay away from it. It was never about politics. It was about the love of Jesus. Our hope is not in politics. It's in Jesus alone. When I was a pastor, I wanted to speak the truth in love and give women options and save babies' lives because I thought the Bible I was preaching said, that's exactly what we should do. That Bible says, rescue those who are being led to slaughter. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. It says, defend the widows and the fatherless. And because the Lord I love wants us to do that, I was trying to help women and children and families because God says we should. At its heart, abortion is not a political issue. Think about it. If a drunk driver was speeding down the road at 50 miles an hour and a child was standing in its way, what would you do? Well, hopefully anything to get the child out of the way. Why? Would it be so you could protest drunk driving? Would it be to make a political statement or to impose your morality on someone else? Of course not. Your goal would simply be to save an innocent life. That's what pro-life work is is all about. It's an attempt to follow Christ by loving our neighbor and intervening for the least of his brethren. It's putting out a lifeline to rescue drowning women and children. We should never believe Satan's lie that we must choose between the welfare of women and children. It's never in a woman's best interest to kill her child. And it's not Planned Parenthood or pro-choice groups or atheists who are going to come and help the women devastated by abortion. On the contrary, it's pro-life groups, pregnancy resource centers, all kinds of Christian ministries that are there to help women. Jesus never called the Great Commission the Great Commission, though I think it's a good name for it. But in Matthew 22, Jesus identified the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and then a second like it, love your neighbor as yourself. In a parallel passage in Luke 10, it starts with a command to love God and neighbor. Then a man asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. 
Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This man questioning Jesus was trying to define neighbor in a way that would exclude certain needy people. Christ presented the Good Samaritan as a model of our behavior. Go and do likewise. He went out of his way to help the man lying in the ditch. In contrast, the religious hypocrites looked the other way because they had more important spiritual things to do. Say, so we are the Bible-believing conservatives, the priests and Levites of our day, people who believe God's word. In the last 15 years, more and more evangelical Christians have co-opted the term pro-life. They say, well, I'm a pro-life Christian, but, and then they talk about pro-life meaning more than unborn children, to which I respond, good for you. You're absolutely right. You, you're right to be concerned about feeding the poor and uh, dealing with sex trafficking and caring for the environment. I care about those things too, but if you refuse to speak up for the unborn, you're leaving out the weakest and most vulnerable people. It should not be either or, it should be both and. Pro-life can mean more than concern for the unborn, of course, and it should, but it should never mean less than that. And to the people who have co-opted the term pro-life, uh, when they're doing nothing to defend the rights of unborn children, my response is, Choose another word. This one's already taken. There have been evangelical justice conferences put on by several evangelical organizations in which every injustice in the world was addressed except one, abortion. Why was it left out? And I've talked to people who have directed those conferences. Well, some causes are cool, or rock stars in Hollywood get into feeding the hungry and fighting sex trafficking, and I'm grateful they do, but they don't ever speak up for unborn children, or almost never. So back to the Good Samaritan. If you were the man whose life was saved and you heard about someone talking about God, who, who would you listen to? Would you, would you listen to the spiritual sounding, theologically correct priest and Levites who ignored you? or the Samaritan who helped you. I mean, people always listen to whoever helps them. Question, was it a distraction from the main thing to save the life of the man in the ditch? Well, to the priest and Levite, it was a distraction. They had sermons to preach, they had tithes to collect, but Christ condemned them for failing to help the needy, and he commended the Samaritan for getting down in the ditch and helping a dying man. In Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have not done it unto one of these, the least of my brothers, you have not done it to me. And if you've done it to them, you've done it to me. Whatever we do or don't do for the needy, Jesus takes it personally. Read that whole passage and ask yourself if intervening for the needy is some peripheral issue that distracts the church from its main business. On the contrary, it's a vital part of our main business. So you remember Dave, that guy, that seminary student, that I was his advisor, who said the pro-life issue is distracting us from the main thing, which is the Great Commission? I asked him how he was doing in sharing his own faith. And then he explained to me that since he'd come to seminary, he really hadn't spent any time with non-Christians. I said, well, uh, Dave, uh, you can't be distracted from the main thing because you're not doing the main thing in the first place. I gave him examples of men and women who had been reached for Christ through pro-life outreach, including that girl that we took into our home who came to Christ. Years ago, I spoke at a pregnancy center in the state of Louisiana that had already led over 2,000 women and men to faith in Christ directly through their pro-life center. Most of them had become part of 
local churches, baptized, growing in the faith. Nothing opens up doors for evangelism, the Great Commission, like need-meeting ministries. 26 years ago, my own church was picketed by pro-abortion protesters. My youngest daughter, Angela, was then a teenager. The two of us were standing in our church parking lot, serving coffee and donuts and sharing the gospel with the three groups who came to protest us for being pro-life. The names of these groups were, and I'm, I'm not making this up, these are actual names, Rock for Choice, Radical Women for Choice, and then the third one called the Lesbian Avengers. I spent an hour and a half that day sharing the gospel with one protester in particular. One week later, our church was picketed by a group of pro-life Christians who thought we had been wrong for giving coffee and donuts to people who believe in abortion. Uh, our logic was, who needs this more than anyone else to be reached with the gospel than people who are defending the killing of children? Some people will stand against us for telling the truth. Others will stand against us for showing grace. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Grace and truth should be the heart of the pro-life movement, all that we do. Pro-life efforts open great doors to evangelism. Students who do a speech on abortion have follow-up conversations that can lead to sharing the gospel. If you volunteer for pro-life work, you have built-in opportunities to share Christ you would otherwise never have. Those who do sidewalk counseling at abortion clinics and pass out literature there, and share the love of Jesus. People who open their homes to pregnant women can demonstrate a love that makes the words of the gospel credible and inviting. By God's grace, that's what we were able to do for our friend Diane, who became really part of our family. So on the question of how standing up for life relates to the Great Commission, all of our pro-life groups fulfill what Jesus called the greatest commandment to love God and to love our neighbors, including our unborn neighbors and the parents of those unborn. And it also fulfills part of the Great Commission because it shares the gospel. But there's actually more to it than that. The Great Commission is more than evangelism. Jesus didn't command us merely to make converts. He commanded us to make disciples. So yes, that starts with evangelism, but it doesn't stop there. He told us to be, quote, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's what Matthew 28, 20 says. He didn't just say teaching them to believe everything I've commanded you. He said teaching them to obey. So what did Jesus command us? He commanded us to take sacrificial action for the weak and needy. That's what the Good Samaritan story is all about. So that's part of the everything I've commanded you. So if in the church we fail to intervene for the suffering and needy and to teach others to do so, then we fail to fulfill the Great Commission. We show the world that our words about the gospel are just that, just words and nothing more. Polls show that in the United States, one out of five women getting an abortion identifies herself as a born-again Christian. This means the church is killing its own children at the rate of hundreds of thousands per year in the United States. Our churches are filled with young people, couples, parents, grandparents, sympathetic friends, and even church leaders who have innocent blood on their hands, and I'm sure that's true in other countries as well. Scripture says God hates the shedding of innocent blood. He hates it in our nation, and he surely hates it all around the world, and he hates it most of all in our churches. Let's work on changing our churches. Please get your churches more involved in supporting the pro-life work that you do. Reaching out, networking with people in the name of Jesus who are people who already profess to believe the words of Jesus and help them to see the connection between the great commission and the great commandment that we love others. We started with William Carey, the father of modern missions. 
other evangelists and missionaries, like evangelist John Wesley actively opposed slavery and he encouraged mine workers to unite in order to resist the inhuman treatment by their employers. Evangelist Charles Finney worked in the Underground Railroad, taking many slaves to freedom. Evangelist D.L. Moody opened homes for underprivileged girls, rescuing them from exploitation. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in London, built 17 homes to help care for elderly women. He built homes and a school for orphans, rescuing them from starvation and vice on the streets. Amy Carmichael rescued many sexually exploited girls in India. She built them homes, a school, and a hospital. Now, what do we remember each of those people for? For their evangelism. But we forget their commitment to intervention for the weak, the needy, and the exploited, which is exactly what gave them a platform for evangelism. Perhaps the effectiveness of their evangelism was due to the fact that unlike some other Christians, they lived out the gospel that they preached. That's what our pro-life ministries are doing all over the world. That's what all of you are doing all over the world. So one day in heaven, you'll hear God say to you, well done if you've been faithful to him. And you're going to meet people who will say, thank you for that ministry. And thank you for volunteering in that ministry. That's where I found hope and help. And that's where I came to know Jesus. And I raised this beloved child that I nearly killed. I raised them to love Jesus too. And that child rescued from abortion will reach out their hand and thank you also. And, and it will not get much better than that. You won't regret one dollar or one hour you devoted to and invested in pro-life ministry. Uh, you, you'll wish you'd given more of your time and money and prayer, not less. And all the people you're reaching will wish the same. So let's do now what we'll one day in retrospect know we should have done for the good of others and the glory of God. God bless you for your pro-life work as part of the Great Commission and part of obeying the Great Commandment. And God bless you for coming to the Global Congress for Life. Or if you can't come, for participating online. Well done, good and faithful servants of Jesus.